Hello everyone. This week our teaching assistant is once again Molly. Say hello Molly. So for our final recorded lecture, we are bringing it all together. So everything we've learned over the past semester and how to apply it to your practice. Specifically, we're going to start with linking uh, research to practice by critically thinking about whether and how we can apply research uh, to practice because you can't always use the information you find. It might not fit or uh, it's not the answer to the research question that you had. So this is the final step. Now, there's two important things to consider. First of all, the link to practice is not all or none. Um, not all of the findings in the research study are going to be applicable to your situation and the intervention that you're interested in uh, or the client population that you're serving. Maybe just some parts uh, of an, inter uh, an intervention study or a research evaluation will be useful for you and others will not. And second, you also have to consider what is the best available evidence. Social work um, is only recently starting to become more uh, research rigorous. Uh, until now, the interventions we've tried have been based uh, primarily on uh, common sense, people's experiences, etc., without a lot of research behind it to back it up. However, things like animal-assisted therapy, art therapy, um, etc. are gaining recognition and we are starting to look more critically as to whether these uh, interventions actually work or not. In cases where there just isn't information available yet, for instance, with animal assisted therapy, um, we know that taking care of animals can be very uh, helpful for reducing the recidivism of um, people who've been in prison. That might suggest that they could be helpful for other populations as well. So even if there isn't a research study specifically on, um, you know, use of animal with um, homeless uh, people, for instance, we can look at similar research and similar populations to try and determine based on this evidence, um, could it work or not. So if there is no research study that perfectly answers your research question, look for the next best thing, next closest evidence. You always have to consider, though, in terms of what type of research the study is and um, what it can tell you. With qualitative research, you have to remember that you can't generalize the findings to a wider population because they're based on a very specific uh, sample, but you can still learn from the results. For instance, uh, are the study's findings consistent with your experiences? Have you encountered these concepts before in your practice? And is it possible that uh, the findings from the qualitative study could help the service users that you work with? If you're looking at quantitative research, you ask yourself some similar questions. You consider the study type and if the sample size is large enough to allow us to generalize to other populations. And you also have to consider whether the study context, as in where it took place, the sample with which it was connected, is it similar to your practice environment? So that will influence whether or not you're going to get the same results um, if you apply it to your practice. You also have to consider how you can um, adapt the study to your practice because it's going to be very rare that you can directly apply something to your practice. You usually have to do an adaptation of it and you need to consider how any changes to the original study uh, will implicate, will have implications for the end results for your um, participants and the service users.
So all of this goes right back to critical thinking, which we've mentioned all the time during this past semester. So you always have to be thinking about what the study or body of literature means for practice, what other research on this topic uh, exists, and you need to keep an eye out on new research findings. Setting up Google alerts, for instance, for yourself can be very helpful. That way you get alerted whenever um, a new publication in your area of research uh, comes up. It's emailed directly to you, so you don't have to uh, search it out. And you also have to consider whether the sample of the study is similar uh, enough to the children and families you work with in order to be applicable. And if the research is in a similar context as well. For instance, if the research took place in a very well-funded urban organization, but you're in a small rural organization that's short of resources, is the intervention going to be able to be uh, applied the same way with these same effects. And that's why you need to consider how these differences and similarities are going to impact the relevance and the applicability of any of the research studies uh, that you find. So when it comes to qualitative research, this is an example. Um, a qualitative study exploring mothers' experiences of intimate partner violence, wherein women do not necessarily feel like victims, women feel like they're in control, and they feel guilty about their ch children being exposed to violence. Since this is a qualitative study that can't be generalized to most populations, you need to develop um, some critical thinking questions. For instance, um, what can you expect from mothers living with intimate partner violence? Uh, some questions that you might consider are, how do you feel about being in this situation? How do you feel about your child being in this situation? If the discussion needs to go deeper, uh, you can use the research as a prompt. For instance, you could say, I've read a study that explored women's feelings about IPV and there were many contradictory feelings. What do you think about that? So that's one example. Example of using a quantitative study in your practice uh, is a randomized control trial in the U.S. found um, TH tutoring is the most effective form of educational support for children at risk of poor educational outcomes. Uh, differences between intervention and control group were statistically significant. So you have to consider, do these findings support um, correspond, sorry, with other findings on uh, TH tutoring, yes or no. Here, of course, TH just refers to um, a made up uh, tutoring intervention, not something real. Anyway, so you consider, uh, is the sample similar to the one at your practice agency? Uh, is the sample size uh, possibly um, generalizable. So if there's 50 per group, then that's a very good sample size for a randomized controlled trial. Um, and this will be usually discussed in the discussion section of the study where you'll also see the limitations. You also need to consider, as I mentioned, whether the study location could potentially make a difference, uh, rural versus urban, uh, the province that you're uh, looking at, um, since that will impact uh, the demographic characteristics. For instance, um, Windsor demographically is quite different from someplace like Toronto, where 50% of the population um, speaks another language as their primary language instead of uh, English. And then lastly, you need to consider whether the methodology is very strong. Um, and if it is, then yes, you can refer you to this uh, tutoring intervention and you can feel good about uh, promoting it at your practice. So how does uh, this new information that we've covered over the past few weeks align with the other elements of evidence-based practice? You need to consider how the research applies to not just your agency, but your specific uh, client case that you're looking at, um, or if it's possible to use in future cases. And you really need to look at whether 
the research um, intervention or whatever it is if it fits with what your service user uh, needs or wants so even though um, there might not be a lot of research showing that animal assisted therapy um, is very successful if that's something that your service user really wants to try then it's your responsibility to uh, try and meet those needs in the best way possible given the research evidence and you always need to consider your own experiences and biases um, as well as the organizational biases and experiences how willing are they to try new things um, how willing are they to monitor uh, the service delivery to see if the client outcomes are actually uh, better than when the clients first come to the agencies a lot of agencies uh, which are small don't have the quality assurance departments to ensure that uh, service user outcomes are actually positive after being involved with the agency most agencies just give their clients uh, a survey at the end which is how satisfied were you with your caseworkers how satisfied were you with the services you received these kind of um, questions are very much based on uh, how the service user is feeling at that particular moment and if they're concerned that any negative feedback is going to impact um, future services from the agency they're always going to be very very positive in their feedback however we don't actually know if the intervention that we implemented really did you know improve uh, their mental health symptoms or if it improved their housing stability whatever it is the organization is aimed at doing before you wrap up i just want to remind you all that critical thinking has um, five different steps and i strongly urge you to check out this resource here listed at the bottom of the slide um, and always engage in critical thinking in all areas of evidence-based practice, how they apply to one another, uh, and make sure that you consider not just the information, but how the information interacts, because there's no one way to successful outcomes for service users. What might work for one service user isn't necessarily going to work for everyone else. Uh, and that's evidence-based practice in a nutshell, making sure that uh, you're using the research, you're using, uh, you're considering your own biases and the organizational limitations in how to apply that research, and you're considering the context of the case as well as the preferences of the user as you're applying this research.